Hi, I'm Jane Moss and I am here today with some nice young ladies at Hey Good Mill. We are going to be talking today about clay. Um, clay, we're very lucky here in the upstate of South Carolina. We have lots of clay deposits here that we can find in our own backyards. Um, back in the 1800s, people used to have to go and dig out their own clay, refine it, process it, and then they could use it on a wheel or using their hands in order to make vessels and things to eat out of, drink out of, and hold liquids and things. Back in those days, we didn't have plastic containers and other things to keep liquids and other food products from spoiling. And this is how we did it. This is also how we ate. So, how are you guys today? Good. Awesome. I hear you want to play with some clay. Mm -hmm. Well, first off, I want to show you how you can get that clay out of your own ground here in South Carolina. So most of, the, most of the time around here, we have nice streams that go through our woods and things. Mostly in streams and near water, where water is rushing down the hill, that's where you're going to find clay deposits. Clay is a type of soil. It is the smallest particle of soil that there is. That's why we can actually extract it from other soil. So when you, when rocks and um, mountains are hit with water, the erosion is what breaks down those rocks and it puts them into tiny, tiny little particles. And those little particles are what it becomes clay. Clay sticks to itself too, which is what makes it easy to kind of harvest. It collects together as it's running down a hill. So the more rain and water, if you go and find a bare spot on a hill and it, it looks like very hard dirt under there, often red, that's usually clay. And so what we're gonna do today is figure out how to tell how much clay is in your soil at your house. We did a, a little sample over here. You guys wanna step back a little bit? We took samples from different places around Haygood Mill. As you can see, each one looks a little bit different. This one here, it's just a little bit milky at the top, but mostly it looks like dirt. This does not have a lot of clay in it. This was taken from the path. We knew that was gonna be a little bit sandy. We took one also from a different area here. I'm not exactly sure we, where we took this one from, but as you can see, this milky area here, it's a little thicker. That means there's more clay in that one. This last one that we took from the garden, very milky. That's what we're going to be able to say, this one has the most clay in it. So this is the one that we would like to use. We took another sample of that right here. So what you would do is you would take a jar or a bucket, you fill it about halfway full with your local dirt, and then we're going to pour some water in on top of that. I keep my water nice and warm so that it doesn't freeze our hands while we're playing. Add some water. And then you're gonna wanna shake this up and stir it up until all of that dirt has kind of dissolved. Were you the shaker? Who would like to shake? <clears throat> so really what you're gonna wanna do is shake it enough to get all of that dissolved as best as possible. Once that's dissolved, you can sit it to the side for a few minutes and it usually only takes about two or three minutes for all of the heavy dirt, soil, and rocks to fall down to the bottom. And what you're interested in is this nice milky layer. So typically what I would do with one of these, I would skim the top. I ha I, there's usually a little bit better way to do this, but you can pour off all of the kind of leaf matter and straw and grass 
Although that is actually not a bad thing to have in your clay. Organic matter will burn out in the kiln. So it doesn't even matter if there's a little bit of that in there. Once you've let it settle for a while, you want to pour that off into a piece of sheet, a pillowcase, some sort of cloth that has very fine weaving. And after you've poured just that clay, as soon as you see the silt starting to come, you want to stop pouring. And we let that sit, sit there and soak through that cloth and all the water will come out of that clay. And what you'll have in the end is a mushy kind of clay. And you just need to sit this out in the sun for a little while and let it firm up a little bit. But after a little bit of time, this turns into workable clay. At this time, when it's got this nice consistency to it, it's lost some of its water. It still has a little of its water, but at this point, we can now make things out of it. And that's what I think you guys are excited about. <clears throat> you can put that down to the side if you'd like. So, one of the things that we were talking about or that I had looked into the other day was, um, the people who were doing the pottery back in the 1800s. So you had professional potters, probably a lot of whom came from Europe and brought their skills over to the United States. But we had all sorts of people working in pottery at that time. A lot of people did this on the side of their normal lives because they just needed something to have at home. You can build a kiln in your own backyard, also using your local clay and mud and things like that. And that's how they would fire their pieces. So clay is an interesting thing. When it's in this state right now, it's very mushy, moldable. You can build things with it. You can make shapes. Once this clay has been fired one time and firing means putting it in an oven that goes very, very hot. Now your mom and dad's oven might go to about 500 degrees. Our kiln will go to about 2000 degrees. So it's very, very hot. And once you have put it into the fire, what you get out is something that is like glass. And it's called vitrification. As soon as the um, clay is heated that high, it ends up becoming waterproof. Now you can hold liquid inside of your vessel and it won't come out. Does that make sense? If I were to put water in this before it's fired, it would just turn to mud again. All right. Any questions? Um, how did you get the color on there? Ah, that's a whole nother process. That's called glazing. So after you have made your vessel and you have put it in the fire, you get something out that looks like this. But as you'll see here, that is still soaking in some of that water. At this stage, this is called bisque wear. It has been fired one time to about 1900 degrees and at this point, you can apply glazes. Glazes are made from all sorts of minerals, chemicals, and things that are found in nature. Um, a lot of people back in the day would use organic things in their glazes, including ashes from their uh, fireplace. And what happens is it is a chemical reaction that happens when heated up between the clay and the glazes that gives you this wonderful, shiny, glass-like finish. And depending on what you put into that glaze will give you the different colors. When you're applying the glaze, it looks very different. This glaze actually looks pink when you put it on. And then once you get it out of the kiln, it turns blue. So it's all an interesting chemical reaction that they figured out many thousands of years ago. I have no idea how they did that. Do you want to just make something? 
Next. All right. So one of the things that they made here in South Carolina and in the South was something called a face jug. So when people would sit there and make some jugs and things for holding their food and water, what they discovered was this clay was so much fun to play with that they could do interesting things with it. They can make funny little faces on these jugs. And this became a very well-known uh, art form here in South Carolina, doing the face jugs. Um, there's a couple of potters um, who got very famous for their face jugs. And there's uh, another story that I hope you guys will go and look up at some point. It's uh, about Dave the Potter. He was a slave who learned how to do pottery. And pretty much his whole life, he had to do pottery as part of what his job was. Um, Dave the Potter was a great example of someone who took what they had to do for work and made it into an art. He came up with these huge pots that no one else was able to do. And he would sign his name and write little epithets and little poems on his jugs, which that was a very risky thing to do back in that day because you could get in trouble. It was illegal to teach a slave how to read and write. So we have some really great examples in our history of some great African-American potters, some uh, indigenous potters. That was another thing. Uh, pottery has been around for so many thousands of years. Almost every culture has a form of their, their own pottery. A lot of these, a lot of pottery was done with the coil method, which is making little worms with your clay and then forming them into shapes. And you can build like that. This is an example of something that was built with coils. You also had the wheel. This is also something, most wheels were kick wheels. This is a treadle wheel. You stand up and you put your clay on the wheel and you use this nice stick here at the bottom with your foot. And that is what turns the wheel here. And from there, it's a matter of shaping it and pulling it up into the form that you want. So those are the different ways of playing with clay. So now I will actually let you play with clay. Today we were going to work on making some little face jugs. It's very easy to do. All you need to do is pinch, pinch, pinch your clay. Clay is very malleable and as long as it stays a little bit wet, you can form it into whatever you'd like. So I'll give you each a piece. <clears throat> there you go. And really, when you want to form clay and play with clay, first thing we do is we get it a little bit warm and mushed up in our hands. This is kneading your clay, wedging your clay. The more consistent your clay is, the better it will fire and the better it will act as a vessel that you can use. So when we start to form a vessel, we're just using our two thumbs and we're just pressing pressing, pressing, pressing. And I always move my hands a little bit each time I press. And that gives us a little bit of form. And this is called making a pinch pot. And this is how a lot of vessels were made. And it's just a matter of time and consistency. And you can form whatever shape you'd like. And so from here, we're going to try and make a little bowl and then close the bowl at the top.
Everybody having an easy time with that or no? All right. Clay's pretty, pretty forgiving. And you can always smear it a little bit to fill in cracks. You can also take sticks and twigs and other things to impress into the clay to give it textures. But essentially, we're just forming our clay and forming our clay and building it up. And once you've got a vessel that you like, then you can add decoration to it. And down here they like to put those silly faces on there. Some of them were creepy faces that were a little bit scary. And I think they did that to keep kids out of those bottles. What do you think they might have had in there? Mm -hmm. Probably. There we go. And you can always take away clay to make your vessel smaller or add clay to make it bigger. And once you've got your basic shape, you can take some more clay and add to it. Let's see. If we're going to make a jar, I need to make a neck to that jar. And that's the beauty of clay. You can always change it, always add to it, and always reuse it. The only time you can't reuse clay is after it's been fired one time. After it's been fired one time, it will not act like clay anymore. So, any more questions? I thought you were going to ask more questions. How long does it take to make one of the fancy jugs or big ones? Well, if I'm making a jug on the wheel, it probably only takes about 10 or 15 minutes to throw a large jug. Now that jug needs to sit and dry out. So this is something that I threw yesterday. It's now considered to be almost leather hard. It's still like clay, but up here it's getting pretty hard. This will have to sit for probably five or six days to fully dry. At that point I can put it in the kiln the first time for the bisque firing, and that usually takes about 12 hours in the kiln because you have to slowly get it to be uh, to the temperature that it needs. What would happen if I put this in the kiln right now? That's right, why would it blow up? Because you've already put it, it's like still wet. What happens to water when it gets over 212 degrees? It evaporates. It boils and it starts to evaporate. And so that's what would happen if that water that was in this pot right now would start to boil, it would explode. So that's why we have to wait for things to dry. So after the first 12 hours in the kiln, then I would take it out, apply some glaze, and then it goes back in the kiln for another eight hours. So it spends almost 20 hours in a kiln. That's a lot of time. All right. As far as faces, I like to Make a nose, and these things are meant to be ugly. They don't need to be perfect. 
There's a nose. You got a couple of eyeballs. Boom. You can even do some eyebrows. And you can give them different expressions depending on how you put their eyebrows and eyes. You can give them some nostrils. And the mouth. Here we go. And then you can put in some scary teeth. You can put a lid on it. You can put a handle on it. You can use other things to give it more decoration, but you can add a lip on top. But that's essentially how they would do it. And I think at that time, this would have been a fun activity to do in the evenings. There we go. And that is essentially making a face jug. Any other questions? Did you want to see a demonstration of the wheel as well? Yes. All right. I'm just going to reuse this clay, which again, one of the most wonderful things about clay is its reusability. Clay likes to be pounded. All of the little particles are shaped like shields and each one of those shields sticks to each other very well which is what gives clay its great properties all right I need a little bit of water here we've got some sea sponges The clay you put down on the wheel, and then you get it going. The first step of doing something on the wheel is getting your clay attached and centered. Of course, this is a little slippery right now. clay you want to add water to get it slippery this clay is not working at all <sighs> sorry some of this is too hard for the wheel Let's try this one more time. Usually you want your clay to be as consistent as possible. It helps make this go a lot easier. So centering the clay is pressing the clay down and toward the middle to get your clay as compressed and as in the center of the wheel as possible. Once you've gotten your clay pretty well centered, What you need to do is make a hole in it. Oh. 
open that hole up some. Always adding water. And then you're going to try and get your clay to move upward. And there's a thousand different ways to do this. Every potter will do it differently because everybody's hands and arms and things are different. So that's essentially how you do it. After you've made your hole, you work on pulling up your sides. And how thin you make it and how you hold your hands dictates how the clay moves. If I do this, I can make it go outward like a bowl. And they had a couple different tools that they would use. Sticks and other things to help carve them out or to shape them. But essentially, those are the steps. And at the end, they would take a string or something else and cut it right off. But we're not keeping this one today. Any questions? All right. Well, I hope you learned a little something about clay today.